I hope everybody enjoyed their lunch. And we are very pleased to welcome John Slosser to speak here at the Wings Club Foundation. John is chairman of Cathay Pacific Airways Limited. Cathay Pacific is Hong Kong's flag carrier and serves over 200 destinations worldwide. John joined the Swire Group in 1980 and has held various leadership positions in the group's operations in Hong Kong, the United States, and Thailand. John is chairman of the Hong Kong section of the Hong Kong United States Business Council. He is vice chairman and general committee, me committee member of the Hong Kong General Chamber of Commerce and is co-opted member of the general committee of the British Chamber of Commerce. John is also involved with community activities. He is chairman of the Voting Members Committee of the Writing for the Disabled Association, as well as a voting member of the Hong Kong Philharmonic Society. In 2015, John was bestowed with the distinction of Chevalier de la Légion d'Honneur. Uh, John, how did I do? <laughs> so, so, all right, thank you. <laughs> By the French government. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome John Slasser. Letter from the French government soon, but there we are. All right. <clears throat> right. Okay. Dave's quite tall. Um, super. Well, thank you very much for that. And can I just say I'm delighted to be here today. Uh, it's actually not my first visit to Wings, um, and I was assuming nobody would remember my last one, which was about eight years ago. But somebody already said, "Oh, we were here when you spoke last time." Um, it is my first visit to Wings, though, when I'm actually on something that's close to this time zone. Uh, normally, I had flown in yesterday or the day, and I was in third stage of twilight zone about now. Uh, but I'm actually on this time zone, so I hope it will turn out to be quite a good speech. Um, before I get into that, two bits of, of business. First of all, join me in a toast to wings. Um, cheers. I know from being here last time, wings does a, has done a fabulous job for a very long time in bringing together uh, the interesting and always diverse aviation community and its interests. And I'm delighted to support your efforts here uh, by speaking today. Um, the theme of my speech today is the view from the other side of the world, uh, because that's where I basically am. And I wanted to share with you how we see aviation and travel development happening over there. You may get a bit of that here in the papers, but maybe not too much. Um, and before I get to the detail of that, and I'll start with Cathay and how we see things, I just wanted to say a, a quick few words about New York City um, and its importance to Cathay Pacific and the Cathay Pacific Group. Our views on New York are very much divided into right brain and left brain. And although I'm not jet lagged, I can't remember which one is which. Left brain is intellectual and right brain is emotional, is that right? Any medical doctors in the audience or anything who would know that? No? Okay, we'll take that as, as a case it is. The left brain logical part of our attachment to New York is that, look, um, it's one of our most important destinations, and so it should be. New York and Hong Kong are two of the largest financial and capital and professional service markets in the universe, uh, and travel between them is very important. I know loads of business people in Hong Kong who are always getting on a plane going back and forth to New York. Um, so somehow this link between Hong Kong and New York is a part of supporting the global economy and all the sort of things that markets do. That's the logical part. And by the way, I should say, you know, New York is, is a, a fabulous hub for us. Uh, we have a great partnership here in the U.S. with American Airlines, who's, in whose terminal we operate, and they'll take you anywhere out of here uh, and bring people in as well. So we appreciate tremendously the relationship with American. The emotional part of our attachment to New York is so many important moments in Cathay Pacific's history um, have somehow involved New York City. We started ops to New York in 1996. It was a flight that went to Vancouver and then on to New York because the aircraft couldn't make it nonstop at the time. Um, for us, that was by far the most far away place that we served, uh, by a long way, so it was a big step for us. Uh, and we managed, as aircraft technology came into play, to turn it into a non-stop flight in 2004. That was with an A34600. I think at that time it was certainly our longest, the longest flight in the Cathay Pacific network, and I think it was actually the longest flight in the world, the longest non-stop flight in the world at the time. 
Um, it was the first, and in order to operate that nonstop flight, it was the first flight that went over the pole um, back to Asia. Uh, that had never been done before, so it was the first time that we had done that. Um, and as I said, emotionally, it's such a popular route with so many of our passengers. So the emotional side says, look at all these great things that New York has meant to us. Every time we've come here, you know, we've done some great things in order to serve this great city. So uh, we and Kathy love being here, and we cherish the relationship. Uh, with this great city. Uh, and we, as I often say, when we go somewhere, we, we go and we stay for a very long time. So I think we're likely to stay in New York for a very long time. So on now to the view from the other side of the world. Let me start with Cathay um, and talk about how we see, you know, the next 10 years or something in travel from, from where we sit in Hong Kong. Uh, importantly, first, a point of context I need to share. And this is really what's driving the economic part of that picture. And the first part of that is uh, looking at various estimates. Now, I'm not a demographer myself, so I, I read other people's estimates. I take them as, as right. And they're saying by 2030, so just a little over a decade from now, between China and Southeast Asia, okay, but not including India, it's over here, China and Southeast Asia alone, there will be 1.5 billion, <clears throat> that's billion with a B, middle class citizens living in China and Southeast Asia. Um, that is four times the population of the United States, actually slightly more. Um, and those 1.5 billion middle class citizens will have an interest in and will have the means to buy travel and to go and travel. And for sure, uh, you know, looking at Asian countries, Asian people like to travel. Uh, they are interested in going to other places. They have families, you know, because of migrations around Asia over the last, you know, hundreds of years. They're family in different places. So Asia, I think, is a very travel-centric place. And in 10 years' time, you're going to have 1.5 billion people with the interest in and the means to travel. That's an amazing number. Think about the possibilities of that. That's what we think about in Cathay. Now, this is not completely something that's just out there in the future that maybe we'll see one day. Uh, we're already seeing the effects of this, I think, in Asian travel. According to OAG, 15 of the 20 busiest air routes in the world are in Asia Pacific. So 75% of the busiest air routes in Asia Pacific. And actually, five of the top five are in Asia Pacific. Okay, so there are lots of flights and there are big airplanes going between places. And that's what, so you can already see this, this uh, this tremendous demand for travel manifesting itself. IATA, never one to miss out a chance to forecast something, um, have basically said that the number of Asian trips, Pan-Asian trips next year will be 1.7 billion, which is a pretty big number, um, but in 2034, so 15 years hence, will be 3.9 billion, so more than doubling in 15 years. Right, you use your rule of 73, that means 4 or 5% growth a year on a big number, though. So that's fantastic. So that is the important sort of context in which we think about, you know, the travel market in Asia where we're based. So let's talk about Cathay Pacific and where we are in all this. So within that context, you know, we've been thinking about how do we best position ourselves you know, to play a role in that market and this tremendous demand for travel. Um, you know, Hong Kong, certain things we have that we can do, certain things we have that are given to us. Hong Kong, our home, is fantastic. It's perfectly positioned. It's right in the middle of Asia on all the main routes between different places. Hong Kong is somewhere. So we think that's fantastic. We like our position because of the growth potential in the entire Asian market. Um, we have a big and growing fleet now. We've got 213 aircraft now. Most of them are wide bodies. We've got about 20 narrow bodies only. So uh, in shape, we're quite different to US-based airlines, which are mostly narrow bodies with a few wide bodies. We are mostly wide bodies with a few narrow bodies. We've got 70 aircraft on order, so that would be 280 or so, um, which for me is amazing, because when I joined Cathay Pacific in 1980, we had a grand total of 14 uh, airplanes. So it's been, it's been a sort of 45-degree line to the right, really, for most of my time. And by the way, when I look at our fleet, talking about, you know, are we well positioned, um, I think we have a fantastic fleet. It takes a long time as an airline to move in and out of fleet, uh, especially if you've got a significant number of aircraft. So you have to choose wisely in these areas and try to make the best decisions. And I think somehow we've, uh, by hook or by crook, ended up with a really good fleet. We have a lot of long haul routes, New York, Washington, Boston, you know, North America is very big for us, Europe is also very big. So we need a very good fleet of ultra long haul aircraft. 
And our ultra long haul fleet is now very young, very fuel efficient, very eco ecologically friendly because they're the latest and greatest airplanes. So we've got a big fleet of 777-300ERs. As a matter of fact, I think I'm right in saying that we have the largest fleet of 777-300ERs in the world, except for state-owned Middle East carriers. Um, we have a big fleet of A350s, 900s, and 1000s uh, in our fleet now. We're still getting deliveries of some of both, but we'll end up with about 40 of those. Um, and we will have the 777-9 starting in 2021. We'll, uh, 2021, we'll have 21 of those. So really, you know, by that time, the average age of our long-haul fleet will be five, six, seven years, and they will really be the latest and most efficient aircraft. And I have to say, our passengers love them because they've got the latest seats, the latest IFE, everything. It's a, it's a much better experience, I think. You can see the difference between generations of airplane. And yes, it's perfectly possible to you know, update the old ones to be as good, but it's really expensive and it's hard to take them out of service for months on end to do that. So it, you know, it tends not to happen as much as you think it should. So we've got a great long-haul fleet. It's an important part of our growth. Regionally, we're A33300s, 777 300s, but not the ER. Uh, those of you who appreciate the business know the first generation of the 777 ER, 300 was a regional airplane. It's the same length as a 300 ER, but it didn't have the weight and it had downgraded engines on that. I think we were the launch customer because we pestered Boeing into doing it, and eventually they did. Um, and there were only about 50 of them built, and if we could, we would probably buy all 50, um, because for moving around people in Asia, uh, we've got 438 seats in them, business, premium economy, economy, they're fantastic people movers on big, thick Asian routes. And we will have a significant fleet of A321neos going forward. So when I look at the, the Cathay world going forward, I think, wow, amazing ultra long haul fleet, very fuel efficient, very economically friendly, very passenger friendly. And I think Asian fleet, um, fit for purpose, some older planes, but wow, they're great people movers and they'll do absolutely what we need to do on intra-Asian routes. So I like the way we're headed on that um, and there's been a lot of effort to get there. I look at the fact that Cathay Dragon, which is the airline formerly known as Dragonair, um, when we changed the name of it about a year ago, it had nothing to do with the fact that we didn't like the name Dragonair. Dragonair is a perfectly good name and everybody knew it. But you know, in China, this is all about the Chinese name actually, uh, whereas the Chinese name for Dragonair did not reflect clearly that it was related to Cathay Pacific. And so what we really did was change the Chinese name to basically say Cathay Dragon. It was Guatai Gong Gong, Hong Kong Gong Si, which means literally Cathay Pacific Dragon Air on that. So the Chinese customers would know exactly what we were talking about. And we thought if we're doing the Chinese one, we better do it, better do it in English as well. Um, hence Cathay Dragon, which is now by far, and it's not even close, it's by far the largest non-Chinese airline operating into China. We in Hong Kong are considered a non-Chinese airline from Chinese, for Chinese aviation statistical purposes, but Dragonair is by far the largest non-Chinese airline operating into China, which gives us a tremendous feed um, from our Hong Kong hub into China. And it's so important to the Hong Kong hub that we've had you know, the feed to and from you know, 30, 40 different points in China to, to complete travel. Um, what else do I look at and say this is, you know, we've got some things going for us. Very important, I think, is we continue to cherish and to work on improving our reputation for service. Um, those of you who travel on Cathay, especially in, in one of the premium classes, know that we, we really try to offer a, a standard and a style of service that is really different and better uh, than you can get elsewhere. And I am absolutely, unashamedly, unapologetically of the belief that service matters. Uh, it amazes me that how often I think people forget the fact that, you know, travelers, and especially business travelers, never travel once. Nobody ever buys a ticket once, travels, and never travels again. So it's really all about repeat purchase. And therefore, it's about, as an airline, giving people a reason to choose you next time. And what is the best reason to choose somebody next time? The reason is, I had a great flight on them last time. Right, so make today's flight a great one, you know, and you're setting yourself up for the next purchase, and there will be a next purchase. So we really believe in that, and we focus on that going forward. Um, two other things that I think you know, we have that 
look good for me in terms of positioning Cathay Pacific going forward. Uh, we are one of the top three cargo airlines in the world, and we've always been a big cargo airline going forward. We still have 21 freighters. We have a huge US operation in terms of freight. Um, and we fly to a bunch of places that we don't fly with passenger aircraft. So people occasionally say to me, I was driving by Atlanta or Dallas or Houston or Miami, and I saw a Cathay Pacific airplane there. Do you fly there now? And the answer is, yes, we do. Um, but you can't travel on it unless I can strap you to a pallet, um, <laughs> which normally ends the conversation. But you will find us in lots of cities where you won't find our passenger flights going forward. And lastly, but not leastly, um, you know, we have a tremendous partnership with Air China, um, which is one of the largest airlines in China, depending on how you measure things, is it fleet or miles or anything. But they're a really interesting company. They own almost 30% of us. I own about 18% of them. Um, and it's really interesting to work with a big Chinese airline developing themselves in that market and sharing with them our experiences, hearing from them what they're doing, um, talking about how we can do things jointly. So um, we think going forward as China and Asia develops this partnership will only add more and more value for us. Now this brings me on to our most recent um, purchase, uh, which is of Hong Kong Express, which is a low cost airline, or low, low fare airline anyway, hopefully they're low cost to go with it, um, based in Hong Kong. And at the end of March, we agreed to purchase that, air, air, that airline from the HNA group of companies. And I'm sure you've read a lot about them. They've been in the newspapers a lot. It was a very important move for us. Many people have asked me why, because Cathay has not really uh, been a big player in anything like the low cost space. And my answer to that is, I think, kind of boring and straightforward. And it's this, not that I'm trying to bore you, but I just want to explain it. You know, we see the big Asian leisure opportunity coming up over the next 10, 20 years, the next generation. All this 1.5 billion people wanting to go different places for leisure travel. Um, and a, something like a low-cost, low-fare airline is exactly the right thing for that. Um, it's, the airline is 5.5 years old, so it's, it's kind of, I think, got over the initial hump of setup and all that. Um, I, I actually extend some kudos to h &A. It's not easy setting up an airline anywhere, and they did so. They got it going, they got it up to a certain size, but at a certain point, they decided they would like to sell and we would like to buy, so there we are. But I, I do commend them for having got it going. The, airplane, the, aircraft has, the, air, the airline has 20 aircraft now, and I suspect by 2024 or so, when the, the third runway opens up in Hong Kong, we actually call it the third runway system because it's a third runway and a completely new terminal and all the infrastructure that goes with that. I expect that then we'll have 26 to 30 aircraft. And when the third runway opens up, we will have, if you'd like, a kind of running start at being ready to expand that to the degree that the Asian business starts really popping. It would be a totally different picture, I think, to be trying to set up something from scratch at that point, from zero, uh, as opposed to have something that's already ongoing and you've got the systems all running and you've already got 28 or 30 airplanes. I mean, adding the next 28 or 30 probably would be easy on that basis. It would have been a lot harder if you started from zero, so we thought that made sense. Um, we think we can make them better. We can do some things with their fleet, with their, with their certainly the feed from the Cathay and Cathay Dragon networks, with their management. We can do things which we think will make them better. Guess what? They can make us better too. We can learn some things by how, they're do the, how they do their business and some of the trades they make in terms of cost and efficiency and how they run that. So we thought this is a good thing for us. The big question which has been on, on the lips of many people is, can Cathay actually adapt to this and you know, pretend to run a low cost carrier? Um, I've been asked that a bunch of times. Look, the answer is, you know, we'll see, obviously. But we have, our, we have our eyes open. We're certainly not going to go in there and try to turn it into Cathay Pacific or something. It can't be that. That would be a big mistake to do that. And we're certainly not going to make a big mistake like that. So we're, we're eyes open. We're open-minded. There's plenty of relevant experience around to help us in that part of the market. Um, and we think that's going to be OK. So adding that to all the other things I just talked about in Hong Kong, um, in terms of fleet, our capacity, possibilities, culture, the market growth we'll be getting, having different propositions in the market, we think that's a decent positioning for us, given the opportunities that are out there. Now, there are always certainly, no matter how good that seems, there are always going to be challenges, and certainly there are some challenges now. The first challenge we face at the moment is uh, capacity in Hong Kong, 
because the, the two runway system is pretty much maxed out uh, at the moment. And the third runway will only arrive in about 2024. So we've got five years to go on that. Guess what? That doesn't mean growth turns to zero. We can do various things to, to uh, improve that. We can upgauge some things. I actually think the airport and the Civil Aviation Department in Hong Kong, who see this as a real issue, are working very hard to find a little bit more capacity. <clears throat> and when I reflect back on <clears throat> excuse me, the, the last few years of KITAC, which was absolutely maxed out, every year we found a little bit more capacity somehow by being a little bit more efficient. So I think over the next five years, there's a good chance it'll be just enough to keep, to keep some growth possible. That will be fine. Uh, but it's important for Cali Pacific, it's really important for Hong Kong uh, that we have the third runway system open and giving us the opportunity to really expand our presence out there. The second, I think, big challenge in Asia, as we see it at the moment, is, you know, I think for, and you'll be very sensitive to this, for a long time in the U.S., there was clearly a supply-demand imbalance in the market. There was a lot more supply than demand somehow, and that was very ruinous in terms of competition and yield pressure and everything. Asia, because of the fast growth for a long time, always seemed to be roughly in balance or you know, maybe slightly more on the demand, you know, excess demand side. But I think at the moment, despite the fact that the market's growing really fast, you know, supply is growing really fast too. And if anything, Asia is looking like it may be uh, in a situation of being towards maybe a supply imbalance for a time as well. Um, whether that will work out, I don't know, but it's, it's kind of a newer environment than we faced out there for a while. So we're going to have to manage our way around that. And part of our response to that, again, which you may have read about if you were following Cathay Pacific at all, was what we call our transformation program. It's been a three-year uh, effort on our behalf, a structured effort to turn us into better, more competitive, more compelling airlines going forward. Um, my observation on that is we're now in year three. <clears throat> my observation is that the general perception of that is that it was just a big cost-cutting exercise. Um, and look, a part of it was uh, we needed to slim down. We needed to lean a lot of our processes. You know, we needed to take some things uh, that probably were with us from a time when Asia was a, a really inexpensive place. It was very people-intensive. Asia is not such an inexpensive place anymore. We had to figure out how to become more efficient. Uh, we had to figure out how to do more with less. We had to get digital really happening. I don't mean just websites. I mean internally using data and making better decisions and all that. So the, the big uh, underlying idea was we had to, looking at this tremendous opportunity of growth, we had to make sure we had a competitive platform that was going to allow us to compete effectively for our share of that huge business opportunity going forwards. But more than that, though, and this is the, these are the pieces that I think have been underappreciated, um, as I said, we, we have always looking for ways to further enhance our service and our product. Uh, when I speak to the Cathay Pacific team, the two words they hear from me all the time are different and better. Different and better. We have to find a way to be different and better in a way that, you know, our premium passengers notice and which gives them the fabulous experience, which will mean they come back to us next time. It's actually pretty simple, but different and better are the, are the big two words there. Um, so there's been a lot of focus on that. How do we channel more into that? How do we know our customers better and, and be better at that? And I think another interesting part of that was a focus on revenue management and revenue generation, i.e. getting value out of the great products and services that you offer. Uh, and I think revenue management is a fan fantastic subject. I think I could do an entire speech on revenue management, maybe an entire day on revenue management, because actually, I would propose that the, the real IP in the business these days is now in revenue management. Um, so many other things have been made fantastically stable and understandable. Revenue management is still a great art form, uh, and there's real IP in that between airlines. So I'd encourage you sometime to get somebody in revenue management and have them tell you what on earth they're doing. I think you would find that pretty interesting. So to conclude on Cafe, you know, we see the opportunity, we're trying to position ourselves against that along a lot of different axes. Uh, we think the opportunity is real, and we're trying to position ourselves for it and deal with the challenges that we face in getting there. Let me now move on to a few other interesting issues. How am I doing time-wise? I should, five minutes, I'll be done. Um, 
geopolitical things, Hong Kong. You know, how does Hong Kong fare and what's the future of Hong Kong? You probably read about that in the papers here. Don't believe anything you read in the papers here, please. Um, look, Hong Kong as a destination has a lot going for it. Uh, of course, I would say this because it's our home, but it is really true. Hong Kong is just perfectly located. It's right in the middle of Asia. Location, location, location. Hong Kong has it. Um, it is still today, Hong Kong is the largest international aviation airport in Asia. Has to be, doesn't it? It's the largest international airport in Asia. So it's bigger in international terms than Japan, any of the Chinese airports. Hong Kong is still number one. And Hong Kong is actually the largest cargo market in the world, cargo airport in the world, number one. So, I mean, Hong Kong has a lot going for it. You tend not to read that in the newspaper articles here because it doesn't fit the narrative. Um, but the big story about Hong Kong, I think, is, is what we call the Greater Bay Area. Now, who's aware of the term Greater Bay Area? Okay, a few people, well done. Um, the Greater Bay Area is kind of a, a repackaging of what used to be called the Pearl River Delta. And it was a reflection of the fact that a lot of other big Bay Areas, New York, Tokyo, San Francisco, you know, are economic powerhouses, you know, where there's a lot of economy going on and, and they're big drivers of the local economies. And if you count the nine cities, counties in China around the, around the Pearl River Delta, add Hong Kong and Macau to it, you've got what's called the Greater Bay Area. Um, this is a big deal. This is a big deal. Keep this on your radar. It is a big deal and attention is being paid to it. It's got a GDP of about 1.4 trillion dollars, which is the same size as Australia, just in that little area. Um, it's got 70 million people. And as Hong Kong, a city of about 8 million, we said about 10 years ago, you know, we need to, we always need to be the airline of Hong Kong, but we need to stop thinking we're only the airline of Hong Kong. We need to start thinking that we're the airline of the Pearl River Delta because of a huge population base there. And it turns out it's 70 million people. That area alone produces 10 to 12 percent of the GDP of China just in that little area. So this super productive area going forwards. It's a world-class area in many economic, along many economic axes. We have world-class capability in ports and logistics, in financial markets, professional services, aviation, uh, high technology development, largely in Shenzhen, manufacturing in Dongguan, education, all the universities in that area. So this is all going to be kind of more thought of as, a, as an integrated area and tried to try to make it into what it, what it can be going forwards. Now the parts of that, making it better, are sort of physical and non-physical. And the physical bits are infrastructure, i.e. making it possible to get between things. So we now have the Hong Kong Zhuhai Macau Bridge, which actually goes over the Pearl River Delta and ends up in Hong Kong and Zhuhai. You used to have to take a ferry there, or if you were driving, you used to have to go all the way up into Shenzhen around the PRD and come down the other side. It used to take four hours. Now it takes 40 minutes in terms of that. And it makes connections to Hong Kong International Airport, our home, extremely convenient. So that's very good. So we've got bridges, we've got roads, we've got the high-speed train. It used to take two hours to get a train to Guangzhou. Now it's 42 minutes. And very important, you know, a lot of the areas of the, you know, the cities of the Greater Bay Area, Hong Kong, Shenzhen, are very land short. They're so built up, there's not much land. The western Greater Bay Area in Guangdong Province, lots of land, not much development. It's a perfect opportunity with the infrastructure to put your factory, you know, put all your land intensive things in the western PRD. Guess what? Develop that as well, create new jobs and all that sort of stuff, and give yourself opportunities there. So, the physical side is that. The non-physical side is easing the movement of people, capital, goods, data, and ideas. Are you making it into almost one big city where you can just go anywhere and do anything and move money and, and you don't have to go through immigration and all that kind of stuff. It just happens and it's all seamless. Now, interestingly, this is all just being worked on now. This is real-time stuff. Um, and this is an area where China actually, I predict, surprises on the upside. Because, you know, they don't have this big infrastructure in China to tell them they can't do it. 
So they just say, well, we should do this. We should just make it possible for goods to move, you know, without having to go through customs. And it happens. We should make it for people with ID cards from Hong Kong just to be able to go through, you know, putting your card in the machine and go through. So you just don't have to get stopped in immigration and all that all the time. So all this is happening in the next short period. I think it's going to be fabulous. The important thing is that, you know, the greater barrier already exists, and it existed before anybody thought of it as a greater barrier. So the base to develop is already there. Now the question is, how much better can you make it with some, some sensible policies to you know, move away from some of the frictions there? I think it's a really big thing. I think it's really important for Hong Kong, because Hong Kong has real strength in some of those areas. And Hong Kong has been designated as the principal international aviation hub of the Greater Bay Area uh, in the planning. And that's important. So two points. There's practical stuff. You know, keep pay attention to it. Second point is, you know, you'll, you'll see. Um, Maybe in the paper, you know, this plan has been put out to do this, you know, over the next 10 years. And I know, you know, when you read those things, sometimes me too, your eyes gloss over, yes, 10-year plan, okay, that's great, what's next? Um, but I've learned from being out there, you know, to quote the great line from all the James Bond movies, pay attention, 007, right? The plans are what is actually going to happen going forwards. And if you look at what they plan and you look at what happens, there's quite a strong congruence between the two. So when they talk about what they're planning for the Greater Bay Area, I would say pay attention to it um, because it will happen and it's going to be big stuff. Guess what? There's a huge opportunity there for U.S. firms. And in my role in the U.S. Hong Kong Business Council, we are saying huge opportunity for U.S. For firms. Come to Hong Kong, set up. It's easy. Quality of life is good, and from there you can, you know, take on all of the Greater Bay Area, and by the way, all the rest of China too, from a Hong Kong base. So I think it enhances the value of Hong Kong uh, going forward, and it's great stuff. Um, before I leave Hong Kong, uh, two questions with which you can win some bets and get some free meals. Um, which trading entity in the entire world has the most free and open trading relationship with the United States? And which trading entity in the world is it with which the United States has the largest trade surplus in the world? Both of them, Hong Kong, right? Even Wilbur Ross says he has nothing to say about the, the trading relationship with Hong Kong. It's completely open. There are no tariffs on anything, no administrative barriers. It is a great and fantastic trading relationship. And yes, the US's largest trading surplus with anywhere in the world is with Hong Kong. Um, certainly at times, I can take credit for part of that if, uh, if we're having a big Boeing delivery year. Um, but it's not just me. There's other stuff as well. And that's a good thing. But what that underscores is, and this is a really good takeaway, look, Hong Kong and the US share a great relationship and have done for a long time. Uh, those of you who've been to Hong Kong, it's got the energy of you know, and the openness and the let's get it done sort of feeling that you get here in the United States as well. It's a natural, you know, and great partner for the U.S. Um, and that relationship in the middle of various battles going on, you know, needs to be nurtured and protected and recognized. That would be my point on that. Um, a last couple of comments, and then I will stop. Uh, just a, a couple of comments on China, you know, what's going on there a moment. Again, don't believe everything you read in the paper. Um, my bona fides, I've been doing business in China for 30 plus years in four different big business sectors. A few points. A, look, China is big. Okay, I just told you something you all know. It's four and a bit times the United States. Um, number one, number two, uh, and again, this is never mentioned in, in some of the stories here. There are a lot of US companies that have done great in China and do really well there and have great businesses. You know, it doesn't fit the story at the moment, so you're not going to see it mentioned. But there are a lot of companies that do really well in China and have done for a long time. And I've been involved with some of them, but I will not say any more on that, just to keep them out of the newspapers. Um, but it's not the case that everybody is having a miserable time there. There are a lot of companies that, that have been doing great there from the US. Um, you know, size does matter in many ways, not in every way. Um, over the last 20 centuries, this is a great sound, but over the last 20 centuries, uh, China was the biggest economy in the world in 18 of them. Okay? Uh, and it was, it was the biggest economy in the 18 when productivity basically didn't matter because the productivity globally was about the same. Okay? In the 19th century, Britain 
grew up the Industrial Revolution. They became bigger than China. In the 20th century, the United States grew up you know, with productivity and became the, the biggest economy in the world. Because at that point, when there's a big productivity difference, that can offset the size difference. But size does matter sometimes. Uh, again, in international aviation, you know, the, the size of the international aviation outbound market from China is now about 150 million passengers a year. And it's growing at 10% a year, which is huge. Um, a great statistics in 2016, Chinese airports handled 1.016 billion passenger movements going forward. So in, a, in a, something like aviation, size does matter, you know, and China, just because it takes people to travel, you know, China will be the biggest travel market in the world if it's not already uh, on that. And that's fine. That's a good thing. Um, but the U.S. look is still, I think, the most efficient economy in the world, the most productive and dynamic and innovative economy in the world, that's not going to end soon, frankly. It's not going to end soon. And all this talk about sort of world domination or something, I think, is, is really hyperbole. Uh, you know, you've got a lot going for you here. China is working very hard to develop themselves, but I don't think you need, quite need to feel that anybody's, you know, right up behind you breathing down your necks on anything yet. You've got a long, they've got a long way to go still. But look, China does deserve some credit, uh, I think, in the 1970s, at the end of the 70s when I got there. Something like 90% plus of China uh, lived in very impoverished conditions. That was just the result of where they'd got to. 40 years later, with the focus on development, about 700 million people, again, that's two, two plus USAs, have been lifted out of poverty, at least into the middle class, maybe lower middle class, but it's at least definable as middle class. Again, that's two times the USA lifted out of poverty over 40 years. I mean, think about that. Where would you start trying to do that over a 40-year period? That's just, you know, maybe two generations, one and a half generations. Amazing development. And look, in economics terms, for, for some time now, you know, until India suddenly makes its appearance on the scene, the US and China are going to be the two largest economies in the world. Guaranteed. I don't know anyone who would say otherwise. So it seems to me that somehow we are going to need to learn how to live with each other. Uh, because when you're number one and two, and there's no prospect for anyone else being in the number one and two, well, you've got to figure out how it is that you're going to coexist. Um, so what do you end up with? I mean, you can have strategic competition. You can have strategic cooperation. My answer is you need both. You have to have both. You have to be creative and find a way to do both. I was trying to coin some words. Do you have strategic comparation? Or do you have strategic cooperation? Um, and I decided that what you should have is strategic cooperation because the cooperative part comes first. And that has to be there. Of course, the economies are compete. Companies all over the world compete all the time. Right? But there also has to be strategic cooperation to go with it. Because when you're the number one and the number two economy, um, it's just that way. You know, that's not to say for a minute that trade discussions are wrong. It is totally right that open, fair trade opportunities have to be there for both sides, no question. You know, if that's not the case, it needs to be resolved, you know, no doubt about it. Um, but I see that as a shorter-term transient issue that needs resolving. The longer-term issue is still strategic cooperation. So the number one and the number two economies you know, support each other and, in a way, help grow each other. Because, again, when U.S. companies look at the China market, they see 1.4 billion consumers. You know, and some of the businesses that do really well there have figured out how to talk to all 1.4 billion consumers. So trade is a good thing. I think trying to divide the world into spheres is a bad thing. Um, it's just not going to get us there. You know, when people ask me, what do I think about the world in 10 years, 2030, 2035, um, given that I don't have an obvious answer, I normally respond with a question. And the question is, well, tell me about the US-China relationship at that time. Because based on what that relationship is, I will tell you what I think the world will be. Uh, because somehow, between number one and two, strategically cooperating, and of course competing, because it will always be that way, getting that right is probably the most important thing over the next 15 years here, as far as I see it. Let me stop there. Um, I've appreciated your attention, and I hope I've told you a few things you didn't know, and I've probably told you a few things you did. Um, but thank you very much. <laughs>
Well, thank you, John. That was fascinating. I mean, it's, it's, it's great to get the perspective from the other side of the world that we, we probably don't get here. So we have time for a couple of quick questions if anybody wants to ask. Here we go. Thank you. My name is Mary Kirby. I work as editor of a publication called Runway Girl Network. And we focus a lot on uh, the airline passenger experience. And two things that have kind of emerged in the last few years with respect to Cathay was number one, going 10 abreast on the 777. Going 10 abreast yes. on the 777. So I'm curious as to what the reception has been like from where you sit as an airline, because we know what the reception has been like in the news and by certain mobile social passengers. And then separately to that, you've also experienced a lot in the way of problems with suppliers on your A350. And those problems still are continuing to bite, as we're seeing on social media. So how do you maintain that premium, which Cathay is known for being that top tier carrier, that premium carrier, going 10 abreast on the, on the one hand in economy and dealing with these supplier issues on your A350 and taking a hit there to your premium image? Sure. Well, you know, look, I think people, people who travel a lot I understand that you know, there was sort of ups and downs on it, and they look at the, you know, what you're able to achieve over time, and that's where I think the consistency really comes into play. On the ten abreast, I would say, you know what, um, I would like to say, uh, you know, we made the decision, but honestly, the market made the decision at the end of the day. It was interesting when the 777 came into service, uh, most carriers went nine abreast, and a few carriers went ten abreast. Uh, and they took a beating for being 10 abreast. But strangely enough, over time, um, more and more carriers migrated to 10 abreast in the economy section of the 777s. I think part of what facilitated that was, uh, and you've seen over the last generation, rapidly improving and innovative seat products that made, made the seat better and, and all that sort of thing. And at the end of the day, honestly, now, um, you know, 10 abreast has become the standard in the 777. And, and if we hadn't gone there, we, I think, would have stood out as... Um, people who weren't paying attention to what was going on in the marketplace. You know, a side benefit of that was the fact that as Hong Kong's approached capacity, that's allowed us to add some additional economy capacity to our aircraft. But that wasn't the primary move. The primary reason was basically the market said that Tenebrest works in the airplane, especially with new and better seats. And all the seats we're putting in are the really new and better ones. Um, and yep, some people will say it's, it's a downgrade. But overall, we found the passengers like the experience. Um, so we don't have any regrets about that. You know, on, on various bits about airplanes, we, had some, we always have some challenges on various airplanes at various times. Um, certainly on the 350s, we had to work to keep our cabin stuff good at the beginning, but we're, we're most of the way through that now. We think it's better. Um, there are bound to be challenges going forward, but um, you know, we focus on you know, the goal of the long-term consistency of the service, and, and when the people feel that, and they feel it sincerely that that's what you're doing, you know, they, they stay with us. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Jennifer Clay, jetlinercabins.com. Mr. Sosa, uh, does Cathay Pacific have an ecology green program? Given the pollution levels reported in the China area, uh, this has to be an important subject. And as a top tier carrier, there's an opportunity to play a leadership role. Is Cathay Pacific active on the green side? Sure, sure, sure. Side? And it's an entire speech in itself, what we do on that. Um, and I won't try to do that in, in two minutes, but a couple of things that, that stand out for me on that is, you know, that the very best thing you can do in aviation um, for eco-efficiency is have new planes, because new planes are by definition uh, more, more friendly than old planes. Um, I was, we were talking at lunch, and there's kind of a Moore's law in aviation, uh, which is that aviation efficiency goes up about 15% every 10 years. One and a half percent a year, because each new generation of airplanes is about 15% better. That's been going on for 30 or 40 years. So, um, if you're two generations behind, um, you're 30% behind in terms of your eco efficiency. So, for us staying, you know, right up at the forefront of that, especially in the ultra long haul aircraft, is really important. Um, the second thing is, you know, we do lots of things, but the one that comes to mind here in the U.S. is we were one of the first partners with Fulcrum Industries, who are you know, embarked on a project of turning mun municipal solid waste uh, into jet fuel, right, and recovering the calorific value in municipal solid waste and turning it into jet fuel. I think we were the, the second airline to sign on with them. And the plant uh, that is the result of that, which I believe is in Nevada, um, is just about to open, I think, in the next year. Um, so we're really excited about that. And they are trying to, you know, prove that there's a scalable technology. It seems to me there's been a lot of work done on biofuels, and the whole proposition that can you generate a biofuel that will power an airplane has more or less been resolved. The answer is yes. 
Some interesting issues about calorific value, though. Um, you know, if you're, if you're short of the fuel limit, it doesn't make much difference. If you're running right on the fuel limit, calorific value of the fuel matters a lot. So there's an interesting question there on biofuels. Um, but the big question on biofuels, how do you scale it? How do you make enough to power even 1% of, you know, world's aviation? Um, and so actually getting some scaled plants up you know, really doing it to prove what kind of efficiency you can get out of it, and that's what Fulcrum are doing, uh, is really important in that. And I think United Airlines is another partner of, of uh, Fulcrum, I believe, and maybe, maybe other airlines are as well, but I remember we got into it during my time. Very good. <clears throat> Thank you, John. We would like to present you with this plaque uh, presented to John Slosser in grateful appreciation for your presentation at the Aviation Leader Series of the Wings Club Foundation, New York, May 2019. Thank you. Thank you. Thank great you. job. Really great job.